So transposition of the great arteries or transposition of the great vessels. What do you think that means? Switched. That's right. We're switched. We're going. We got blood going in the wrong direction. So um, the way the heart develops is it develops from a single cell, of course, and then it, it grows um, just like the, the human body from the center to the outside. And so it grows out and it tends to twist upon itself as it's growing, which is why the atria wrap over the ventricles. That the heart is in a box with four, two ups and two downs. They wrap around each other. Um, in, a, in a curving fashion. And so as that happens, you can get the bl blood vessels switched going to the wrong direction as they're coming out of the heart. And so um, it happens once in a blue moon, we get these transpositions of the great vessels in utero that we don't notice in utero because, of course, um, the baby's got fetal circulation. It doesn't matter where the blood's going. It's all going to end up in the same place. But once they're left on their own, they come out and they start to switch to extrauterine circulation that's when they start to have problems. Um, cyanosis, shortness of breath, uh, clubbing, uh, poor feeding, eventually getting on the clubbing of the fingers and toes, and heart failure. And it's this. So, you know, you've got your aorta coming into the right ventricle, or in the right, yeah, right ventricle, and your pulmonary uh, artery going into the left ventricle, and the, it's only because of a septal defect that allows the baby to continue to survive. And what happens, of course, is all the blood just kind of pools and goes back out again, and you get this cyanotic heart defect with the baby. Um, and uh, so what they have to do is disconnect and put them back together in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Obviously easier than it sounds. Yeah. Or harder than it sounds. Trunctus arteriosus. Um, in the, uh, in the uh, artery itself, uh, you have a twist. Um, the trunk has neither twisted nor formed a septum. Did I not keep a picture of that? See, I need a picture of this one. Who's got a book with you? Show me a picture of the trunctus arteriosus, please. I thought I put a picture of this one because this one blows my, always blows my mind. It's a poor description. There it is, truncus arteriosus. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh. Oh, there we go. All right, so if you look, um, figure 2618, you can see truncus arteriosus. And so what you see is the, uh, the uh, um, pulmonary artery and the aorta are one blood vessel, and they split after they leave the heart. Obviously, you can see where that could cause some trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay, And you get the exact same thing, cyanosis, heart failure, low cardiac output, and ejection murmuring. And then there's tetralogy of Fallot. Tetralogy of Fallot was one of those things that you're going to see just because it's so fascinating. It's tetralogy means four. Four. Four means four problems, and somebody named Fallot discovered it. Okay, so it's the tetralogy of Fallot. A ventral septal defect, an overriding aorta, hypertrophic right ventricle, and pulmonary stenosis. Okay? And it looks like this. So you've got your pulmonary artery that is narrow and not accepting much blood flow. You've got an overriding aorta that comes down the middle and is basically a three-chambered heart. Okay? You have a ventricular uh, septal defect and right, right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay? Are you going to put pictures on it now? No, I won't. <laughs> Yeah, because then I would write, this looks bad. <laughs> this looks bad, yeah. 
you know, that would be, that would be, I think that would be a little cruel. And it, that's just basic knowledge, you know, memorizing what a uh, ventricular septal defect is. It's just basic knowledge. It would be, how do you care for the child who has this? What are your nursing stuff? Okay. Um, you know, what's important there? Or, you know, you might need to know that, like, NSAIDs keep the ductus arteriosus open to support fetal circulation until the heart, de uh, until heart surgery. Something like that. Something like that would be <laughs> useful stuff to know, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And then cardiac trauma. Anytime you talk about kids, you got to talk about trauma because kids are always hurting themselves. Okay? So damage to the heart muscle occurs as a, direct, as a result of a blow, a baseball bat, a car accident, whatever. And it's the same in children as it is in adults. Um, and that is that you get bruising on the heart, pain is mild to severe, um, uh, pulse deficits, heart sounds are muffled, and why would the heart sound be muffled? Because you have pericardial effusion from the trauma to the heart muscle. You guys are familiar with pericardial effusion? It's bleeding into the bag that surrounds the heart. Your heart is surrounded with a pericardium, and when you get trauma, the, you get bruising, and that bruising can cause bleeding in the, in the pericardial sac. Mm -hmm. And the pericardial sac will be, will be there, you have this layer of fluid between the heart muscle itself and the outside, and you'll hear a muffled heart sound. Okay, shortness of breath, hypotension. Why hypotension? Because your heart has sprung a leak, right? And it's not beating very hard, and it's beating uh, with a, a, an altered rhythm and cardio, car, or cardiac shock. And of course the important thing is what happened? Well he was in a car accident, he got, you know, he crushed the chest, crushed the dashboard with his chest. Well that would cause heart, heart trauma, right? Or he got hit in the chest with a baseball bat. Right. That would cause heart trauma, right? It's a blunt force trauma to the chest. Okay? Diagnosis made the same as all the others. We've got to look at the test, or look at the heart. Okay? Pulmonary arterial hypertension. What does that sound like? Sounds like high blood pressure in the lungs. High blood pressure in the lungs, exactly. Why would you get high blood pressure in the lungs? Some kind of obstruction after the lungs, like a coart of the aorta, perhaps, might cause pulmonary hypertension, right? So, um, it's a result of, car of cardiac de defects most often, but it could be idiopathic. Um, in the NICU, we have this thing, um, persistent pulmonary hypertension, where the, uh, there's a, like a co arc of the aorta or a failure of the transition to extrauterine life can cause a backup of blood in the lungs and cause hypertension in the lungs. Okay? So, signs and symptoms are the same we always see. Shortness of breath, chest pain, weakness, fatigue, dizziness, leg swelling. Okay? We see it the same way. We will get an enlargement of the neck, leg vein, neck veins, um, and basically everything the backup of the heart, from because we are now causing a backup between the heart and the rest of the body, and that's going to cause a backup on the right side, because we're not getting blood out of the lungs efficiently for whatever reason. Anytime you can't get any blood out of the heart or out of the lungs, you're going to end up with a backup of blood because everything wants to head to the heart and it's not getting out, right? Neurally mediated syncope. That's a fancy word for a vasovagal, right? It just a pass out. Okay? Caused by exaggeration of baroreceptor response to normal function. Um, it can be, you know, my, my 15 year old does this once in a while for no good reason. He'll stand up and pass out. I'm like, dang it, stand back up again, get back over there. We can't find anything wrong with him, but you know, within, within 30 seconds he's back to normal again. He just once in a while just passes out for no good reason. He's got a normal EKG, normal labs, we've worked him up, can't figure out why. He has neurally mediated syncope. Okay? I want to get beyond all Let's get into some other stuff. Long QT syndrome. So now we're getting into the EKGs, right? Now we're getting into problems with how the heart itself beats. And what do you think the big problem with long QT syndrome is? And long QT can turn into no QT. Okay, they, these are the kids who go up for a basketball, uh, for a layup, and they die in midair. Uh, their heart just stops for whatever good reason. 
Okay, it can lead to palpitations, seizures, and sudden death for no good reason. There's actually um, a, uh, um, a movement to have all high school athletes tested with an EKG before they are allowed to, as part of their school physical, to do an EKG to find this long QT syndrome to get it fixed. Because, you know, it happens pretty rarely, but once in a while, kids just die with sudden heart defect, sudden death sudden cardiac death in, in a sports event. It's always the athletes, because they're pushing their heart just a little bit, and then they die. But, and the idea is that, you know, an EKG is something so incredibly cheap and so easy to do, it doesn't make any sense not to do it as part of a school physical. Will insurance cover that? Well, that's, that's always the question, right? That's, you know, if you make it standard of care, sure, but what insurance companies generally do is say a school physical costs as much. So y'all, you can do whatever you want to during a school physical as long as you only, as long as you know I'm only going to pay this much, right? Yeah. But EKGs are, I mean, they're, they're literally dirt cheap. If you got an EKG laying around, you can run EKGs all day long, right? The problem is, the real problem isn't how much it costs, but having somebody who can interpret it, you know? Because once you do an EKG as a provider, you're now responsible for what that EKG says. Okay? And whenever I look at an EKG, all I see is a fetal heart tracing. I'm like, well, he's got great variability. I don't see very many axles. <laughs> these might have some variables or something. I don't know what these little downward things are. <laughs> the family practice docs always laugh at me when I do that. <laughs> I'm like, doc, you got to help because, I mean, I, I have no idea what this says. It's just squiggly lines on pink paper. Okay? And so the diagnosis of long QT syndrome is made with an EKG. Um, children are often um, completely asymptomatic until they're not. Okay? Other rhythm disturbances, same thing as grown-ups. Okay, moving on, chapter 24. Only two more chapters and 90 minutes to go. Yay. So now we're going to get into GI upset. Okay. Um, remember your functions of the, GI, the gastrointestinal tract. This is kind of important stuff, okay? Because everything's going to kind of revolve around these uh, these things. If you're, the GI tract is there for ingestion, digestion, absorption, metabolism, and elimination, right? So, let's talk about our structural defects like an inguinal hernia. Extremely common, especially in males, inguinal hernias um, arise from a, a failure of the, uh, of the uh, abdominal cavity to close in the pelvis, or the pelvic cavity to close. And so we end up with a loop of bowel that extends uh, oftentimes into the scrotum. And so, if you guys have ever heard all the jokes that they always do it every time a man has a physical, turn your head and cough. <laughs> Why do they do that? So you can feel there's a bulge. Right. Yeah. They, they, actually, well, they, they actually will put their hand on the scrotum and put their finger up into the inguinal canal and say, turn your head and cough. And you, cough, and you only turn your head because you don't want to cough on people. The turning the head doesn't actually change anything. It's just don't cough in my face. So they go, <coughs> and you increase abdominal pressure, and if there's an inguinal hernia, it'll, they'll feel the, um, the bowel press against their fingertip, and it shouldn't press against their fingertip. And when it does, then we've got an inguinal hernia. And it can slip down into the testicle and, uh, um, and incarcerate in the testicle, or in the, in, not in the testicle, in the scrotum, and get trapped in there. And if you get a loop of bowel trapped in the scrotum, you got problems, right? Because what happens to bowel that's looped and trapped? It dies, right? it necrosis because it can't get blood flow. So um, inguinal hernias can cause a problem. So you might see a question like, this guy's got a six month old son and for the last couple of weeks he's noticed that this, when he cries, the scrotum will bulge a little bit, and, but it always goes away. And today, um, it, the scrotum is bulging and is not going away even though the kid is at rest. What do you think that kid has? Yeah. It's an inguinal hernia. And what do you think he needs to do? He's coming to the emergency room right away, right? Because he now has an incarcerated bowel in the kid's scrotum. You might want to think about that kind of question. Might be saying, <laughs> I've seen something like that. It's, <laughs> it's usually painless, and it usually happens when you raise intra-abdominal pressure, like coughing, crying, straining, that kind of thing. Um, and it's painless until it's not. And once it gets strangulated, and once the bowel gets uh, incarcerated or trapped, then it starts to hurt, okay? And so the, uh, the treatment is to provide a 
provide surgery and fix it. Okay. Oh, isn't it cute? What's that? It's an umbilical hernia. It's an umbilical hernia, right? So you see the little bitty, little bitty baby belly button right there sticking out. And that's bigger than just a normal, that's not an Audi, right? That's not just he has an innie versus an Audi. You know, I never see anybody with Audis anymore. What? My MEPS doctor, uh -huh. I was working at the MEPS. Anybody who had an Audi had an umbilical hernia. He diagnosed every single person. Yep, there you go. And then they had to get a waiver. Interesting. Because they had a hernia. Well, <laughs> you guys have been doing assessments. Do you see any Audis? The only time I ever see an Audi is a woman who's 38 weeks pregnant. You know, turkey timer pops, and you know she's done. But nobody has an Audi anymore because they're, they're recognized as umbilical hernias. And if they're not fixed by the age of five, they have to, then, then they'll have a, a, a little bit of a hernia. And all it is, of course, is a defect in the abdominal wall that allows a little loop of bowel to pop into the belly button. Um, it's not a big deal. It's usually a self-limiting thing, and nobody needs any surgery. I had my umbilical hernia repaired when I was 18 months old. And uh, so I have a permanent smile on my belly button. It's so cute. And three of my kids have had umbilical hernias, and we just ignore them. They're gone before they turn five. It means so nothing. It can't just occur after age five, like like a grown well, man, forty years old. Just when they do, then they're usually considered abdominal abdominal hernias, right? There, there. Other men get hernias all the time um, when they get abdominal wall defects. But you don't think of umbilical hernias in grown ups. The yeah, hernias are usually off to the side. My husband, he it's doesn't have something like that. He doesn't have any protrusion or whatever you call it. I mean, but uh, when he was at airborne school, he got like something like um, di he got diagnosed with umbilical hernia. But in the interesting fact is that certain doctor diagnosed almost every one of them with umbilical, her umbilical hernia. And um, we're like, okay, so they have to get labor, like you said. Yeah. They were like, it can't be all of us, like, and then where? I looked, I'm like, there's no much, like, nothing's yeah. weird in your belly, <laughs> like, umbilical. But the point is, if you have an Audi, you have a defect in there that's causing, uh, causing it. Now, it may not be big enough of a defect to allow your, your bowel to loop in, um, but it's still a defect in the abdominal wall because the, the umbilicus doesn't heal that way. Mm. The umbilicus heals to the inside, not to the outside. Mm. Okay. Um, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. What do you think? What is pyloric stenosis? There you go. A pyloric sphincter problem. Okay. So um, it's unknown what causes it, um, um, but it causes feeding difficulties. Um, the big thing about pyloric stenosis is the kids get projectile vomiting with pyloric stenosis. Because uh, they, they, the, they get the food in the stomach and they can't get it out, so they vomit it, and they vomit aggressively. It's not just the normal vomiting that you see. You know, with kids, they talk about spit happens. This is not spit happens. This is aggressive vomiting. Okay? And it, turns, it happens at, immediately after the feeding, and it's projectile. Uh, the babies appear hungry and want to feed again because they, they just threw up everything they had in their stomach. So they didn't actually get to eat. Okay? Hypertrophic, let's see here. Surgery is the only real cure. Intussusception. Another one of those wonderful words that only nurses know. Intussusception. It is where the bowel closes in on itself, like telescopes in on itself. So you've got a normal bowel, and as part of the peristalsis, one overrides the other. I always think of those little, um, those little water-filled tubes. That, that's, that run on themselves. You know what I'm talking about? Little water-filled tubes, yeah. and you, you let it slide through your finger, and it's just, it's like a treadmill of a, tu of a, of a water balloon. Um, um, but it causes acute abdominal pain um, as the bowel spa spasms on itself, and it can mimic top colic. And uh, a key sign of abdominal pain in infants is that they pull their legs up toward their abdomen when they cry. That, um, that they're um, a baby who's got abdominal pain tends to go eh, like that when he cries. He pulls up tightly to, to cry because his abdomen is he's trying to shunt or trying to splint his abdomen. Your abs are gonna be sore now. I would hope my abs aren't gonna be sore from that. <laughs> I got a little bit more abs than that. Just for your reference, it's a water slinky. A water slinky. Okay, that's what they're called. 
Don't bother paying attention to the lecture. Google, what is that thing he's talking about? I wanted to know what I'm talking about. And of course you fix it with that. Now, failure to thrive. Failure to thrive is an interesting problem. Okay? It's where the infant fails to achieve age-appropriate milestones or growth. Or growth. Um, it's almost always seen in very young children. It's an infantile problem. And the question is always, why do they have failure to thrive? Is it organic or is it inorganic? Um, is it the kid who's not eating? Or is it the kid who can't eat? Or is, or is it the kid who's eating and not growing because he can't absorb anything? Okay? In infants, they always uh, diagnose failure to thrive as mom's not making enough milk, and that's not necessarily the problem. Um, but putting extra weight on seems to make it happen, uh, seems to make them grow. Um, so they just give them more food until they track it. Uh, but, it can, but whenever you have uh, um, um, uh, failure to thrive, we look for all the, uh, the organic problems. We look, for we look for signs of malnutrition. We test... Um, test for vitamins, that kind of thing. Make sure the kid's, you know, a, able to eat and able to uh, um, to process the food that he has. And then, if we can't find a reason for it, we tend to think it's it's child abuse of some some sort, um, where they're not feeding the child. Okay. So it requires a nice, thorough physical exam, a good feeding history. Um, you want to watch how the kid eats and what the kid eats, and watch what the kids are feeding, that kind of stuff. Um, and the goal is to fix his imbalanced nutrition, either by teaching mom and dad how to feed the child, teaching the child how to eat, or um, going a little deeper and trying to figure out what's going on in the bowel. Because, of course, it certainly could be organic. It could be a bowel defect of some sort where he's not, where he has a, a, a malabsorption defect, right? Okay. Appendicitis. You can't talk about children and gastrointestines, intestinal issues without talking about the appendix. So what is the key... Uh, um, uh, um, signs and symptom of, of appendicitis? Lower right quadrant pain. Right lower quadrant pain, but specific kind of pain. What kind of pain? Stabbing. There's a word for it. Does it hurt when you press on it? Radiating. Oh, the Radiating. rebound. No, it's rebound. Re rebound. Rebound tenderness. tenderness. Right. You reach in and touch it, and when you pull away, they cry like crazy. Okay, um, when my, um, my son had appendicitis, he was sick for a day, and he just, you know, wasn't feeling very well, you know, he, was, he had the malaise, he had a little fever, he didn't want to eat, you know, very classic, there was something wrong with him, but we didn't know what, and he just wanted to sleep, and he was asleep on the couch, and I was like, hmm, I wonder if he may be his appendix, I don't know, and I walked up while he was asleep, and I touched him on the belly, and I let go, and as soon as I let go, he woke up and screamed, what did you do that for? And I like, they get in the car. <laughs> We're going to the emergency room right now. And sure enough, he had acute appendicitis, and he had his, uh, he had his uh, appendix taken out within like an hour or two. Um, and that is classic. Now, a lot of people get abdominal pain, okay? Um, and uh, it doesn't mean they have an appendix. A lot, problem. a lot of people have right lower quadrant abdominal pain, and it doesn't mean they have an, an appendix problem. But, they get, but when you have an appendix problem, you have an acute abdomen. And this is something people always get confused about. Okay, um, a wonderful way of assessing an acute abdomen, I'm going to do it on Rowena here. Okay. Oh no, I have a big belly. <laughs> no, this is what you do. If okay. you want to assess somebody with an abdominal problem, okay. like if you want to see if they have abdominal pain, just do this. Oh. Bump into them, or bump the bed that they're on. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. If, if you watch, I'm going to touch my belly. If you watch in the emergency room, people will be... Uh, People will be uh, uh, like rolling around the bed complaining about something and a doc will bump them like that. Okay. Like kind of nonchalant, they bump the bed or bump them and they won't even respond. And you'll go, she's faking. <laughs> <laughs> Either she's faking or it's not surgical yet. Okay, um, but you give a little jiggle to the side of the bed or a little jiggle to the patient and they have, a, they have an acute abdomen, they'll respond aggressively. Okay, it's like, oh my God, that's the worst pain ever. What did you do to me? Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's signs of an acute abdomen. So yeah, they just kind of do it like, kind of nonchalantly while you're not looking. <laughs> and bump the bed. And you're like, oh, oh. And like, oh, okay, that's real. Let's get this guy back for a CT and find out what's wrong. Okay. Um, um, but uh, uh, the trick is that uh, acute abdomens are more than just pain. The, if you've got a surgical acute abdomen, especially if you've got an appendix, you generally have... Uh, nausea, vomiting, uh, um, anorexia, fever, malaise, you're acutely toxic, so to speak, and very, very painful. Okay. 
you notice, may see an elevated white count. Sure, you'll get an elevated white count, but that's like, so what? That's so nonspecific, it doesn't help anybody. Okay? Nursing care is to prep for surgery, and then afterward, keep the wound clean and dry, and monitor for signs of infection. Duh. Okay? <laughs> so common sense. Now we do almost all of our appies with uh, laparoscopic surgery, so there's almost nothing. Um, it used to be you'd have a little two to three inch scar in the right lower quadrant. Now it's just three or four lap sites and it's no big deal. Unless, of course, it ruptures. Yeah. Okay. Infantile colic. The actual name for this is um, idiopathic infantile colic. Or idiopathic infantile irritability or colic. Um, and it's the... the the, uh, the scientific definition for it is three or more hours of crying, three or more hours, uh, three or more days of the week. Um, kids are not supposed to cry for three hours straight, ever. And if a kid's crying for three hours straight, there's something wrong with them. The problem with colic is we don't know what it is. Okay, they're just animals. And they cry all the time. And they can't do anything, you can't do anything to make them feel better. And I feel so bad for people who have, whose babies have colic. Um, we've never been able to find anything that really nails down what exactly it is. But it tends to happen around the same time of each day. Um, and again, they pull their arms and legs up um, uh, while they're crying into a flex position. Okay? And like I said, the rule of threes. Three or more hours a day, three or more days a week uh, that they cry. All you can do is be supportive, check to make sure that they're not getting anything wrong. Um, it, it definitely can be actual uh, diet-based problems, like a celiac disease or something like that. The most common source of abdominal pain in breastfed infants is cow's milk in mom's diet. Okay? Yeah. Humans are not meant to drink cow's milk, uh, ever, yeah. and so um, well, while you know, most uh, Westerners can tolerate cow's milk into adulthood. Most of the world is uh, lactose intolerant because by the time they reach adulthood and they can't take cow's milk at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens is mom will have dairy products because it's such a, a common part of our dietary habit. And then it'll pass, those cow's milk proteins will pass into the breast milk um, undigested and baby can have significant bowel problems with it. They get, they get an awful lot of bowel pain, and they can have bloody diarrhea because they have an actual, um, oh, I'm blanking on the exact name, it's um, irritation of the intestines, there's a name for that, colitis, I think it is, they'll have like a colitis, and they'll get bloody diarrhea, and let me tell you something, as a parent, your kid has bloody diarrhea, it'll freak you out. <laughs> and they come running into the emergency room, and there's nothing wrong with the kid, except mom needs to take the, the, breast, the uh, cow's milk out of her breast milk. And so you'll often hear people say, well, stop breastfeeding and see what happens. Or I was breastfeeding, but my kid got bloody diarrhea, and I stopped breastfeeding because he couldn't tolerate the breast milk. He can tolerate the breast milk fine. He just can't tolerate the cow's milk that's in your breast milk. You take the cow's milk out, and all of a sudden it goes away. Okay? And so what we do for, for breastfeeding kids is we, tell, we have mom take out one thing at a time until they figure out what's wrong. Um, it takes two to three weeks for the irritation of the bowels to stop after um, mom has taken the cow's milk out of her diet. So they'll stop for like a day or two and the kid will still have bloody diarrhea and they'll go right back to the cow's milk again. And they just haven't given the, the intestines time to heal. So you have to take it out for two or three weeks and see what's going to happen and see if it gets better. And if it gets better, it just means your baby doesn't like cow's milk. He likes the breast milk fine, he just doesn't like cow's milk. Okay? Um, and then, you know, if two or three weeks of no dairy products doesn't make anything any better, we can start working on other things like tomatoes and chocolate and green leafy vegetables or all that other stuff. Those tend to have a more immediate response. And so I'm not opposed to trying those before I try the cow's milk. It's just that most of the time, cow's milk is the problem. And so I start with the dairy products. And because I'm not interested in what's causing the problem, I say you might want to try to get rid of chocolate and green leafy vegetables and tomato and dairy products all at the same time and see if your kid gets better rather than the trial and error method that could take weeks to figure out, right? I want it to stop now because colic is so miserable. Um, and so I'm not, willing, I'm not willing for it to wait a month. Now, if your baby is formula fed, they'll often switch to another formula and keep switching formulas until they find the one that doesn't cause irritability. Okay? 
You can give medication, you can use Tylenol. It seems to help a little, but not a lot. And then the big one is teaching people um, how to soothe their baby. Um, so when it comes to taking care, to soothing babies, I always teach parents there are three things you want to do, okay? One is to realize never be afraid or angry when you're holding a baby, okay? The sun rises and sets in your baby's eyes or in your face for your baby, and he trusts you explicitly. And so if there's something wrong with mommy or daddy, there's something wrong with the world. And so if you're angry or frustrated, the kid just continues to cry because there's something wrong with you. He's frightened. You're not comforting him. And so I tell people, if you can't, you so always start by being calm. If you can't be calm, get someone who is calm. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's dad. I don't care if it's your grandparents. I don't care if it's your next door neighbor. I don't care if it's an old college roommate you haven't seen in 15 years. Get somebody who's calm to hold the, hold the baby. Okay? It'll do two things. One, it'll make the kid calm down immediately. And two, it'll prevent you from snapping and accidentally hurting your child. Okay, Because a lot of parents stressed out 3 o'clock in the morning, why won't you stop crying? And they hurt the baby accidentally. Okay, Just out of frustration. And you don't need that. So always get calm or find someone who is calm. Baby number two for us, the kid was a wild man. He had colic for the first six months. He was awful to be with. And several days I came home to my crying wife who said, take the devil child and ran upstairs as fast as she could and cried for an hour or two before she was well able to come downstairs. The kid was just, he just wouldn't stop crying. He had colic. And he was a miserable kid. And um, unfortunately in the army I couldn't just be home for a month. So I, had, I could only help when I was home. So, um, so step one is always get calm or find someone who is calm. Step two is always rhythmic and vibrating. Children love to sway, they love to swish, they love to vibrate. And that's why children's like toys are like they have those bouncy car seats and they vibrate, or they have swings that vibrate, or car seats that vibrate, or why kids love to ride in cars, or why it's wonderful to take a, car, a kid in a car seat and put them on the dryer and turn the dryer on. Anything that's rhythmic and vibrating, kids go nuts over. And so they love to vibrate, and it's, it's very soothing for them. So um, there's all kinds of vibrating toys and vibrating infant stuff, but what's a wonderful vibrating thing is Dad's Adam's apple. Okay, when a man speaks, his Adam's apple vibrates in his chest and makes his chest vibrate. Put your head on, the, on a man's chest and listen to him talk, and you'll see there's a deep booming voice that comes out of his chest, and he vibrates. And so I say, put the baby right up on Dad's chest and talk to him like very white. Hello, baby. How you doing? <laughs> And it just it vibrates all over, and the kid buries into the body and goes, oh, where have you been all my life? It's a full body massage, and it's a way that dads, it's a tool that men have that mothers don't have. Mothers have wonderful breasts, they're amazing, it's good stuff, but they don't have an Adam's apple, unless they're Caitlyn Jenner. Um, <laughs> then they'll have an Adam's apple. But that Adam's apple creates a deep, booming, vibrating a sensation that babies go gaga over. And it's why dads are so good at putting babies to sleep at night, because of that vibrating voice in their chest. Okay, So rhythmic and vibrating. The other thing that you can do is, 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 is the swinging thing, the rhythmic swinging, okay? which is why pregnant women wobble when they, when they walk, because they're swinging the baby back and forth uh, in the womb. But it's also why babies love to swing, why they love to be put in swings or carried back and forth. They like to rock back and forth. Okay. So one is to be calm, two is rhythmic and vibrating, and the third, and this is incredibly important and nobody ever figures it out, if it doesn't work in three minutes, it won't work in 30 minutes, and it won't work in three hours. Okay? I can't tell you how many times I've had parents come to me and say, I, he was crying last night and I walked up and down the halls for three hours and he wouldn't stop crying. And I go, when did you realize that he didn't want you to walk up and down the halls? Okay? If you try something and it doesn't work, stop trying, try something else. Okay, Babies don't cry because they're evil. They cry because whatever you're doing is not what they want right now. And so if you ever watch me holding a child, I'll hold them up against my chest while they're crying and they'll fuss a little bit. Ah, I'll try patting them on the back. No, okay. I'll sit down and put them across my knees with the butt a little higher than the head and I'll play bongos on their back. It's a nice rhythmic and vibrating and allows them to move gas if they want to. And if they don't like that, okay, I'll put them on my arm and I'll sway back and forth on my arm. And if they don't like that, okay, I'll try something else. And every, every couple of minutes I try something new until I figure out exactly what it is that that baby wants. 
Okay? It's important to teach parents to be flexible. Don't keep doing something that you know isn't working over and over and over again, like it's going to magically work after 90 minutes. It won't. Okay? All that happens, if it does work, is the kid got so tired he stopped crying. Okay? That's not the same thing. That's, That's how, just a kid who gave up. That's how one of my um, kids thought he said, like, nothing was working on him. Uh -huh. So I thought he needed to try to diaper change, and he didn't. He just wanted to be naked. Mm. <laughs> then taking his clothes off makes him stop crying. Well, there you go. <laughs> and how old is he? Uh, six months. Six months? Oh, That's interesting. I've never had a six-month-old that wanted to take his clothes off. Yeah, Two-year-olds all the time, they love being happy. naked. But yeah, six-month-olds, eh, not usually, but okay. That's funny. okay. Acute diarrhea. The number one source of hospitalization in America is diarrheal illness for children under the age of five. That is the number one reason they get, di they get hospitalized. If you spend any time in pediatrics, you're going to deal with RSV and diarrhea over and over and over and over again. Okay. Um, symptoms are increased frequency in watery stools. Um, what does diarrhea look like in a diaper? You guys know? It tends to look like powder surrounded by a ring, a water ring, because all the water gets absorbed and there's just a little bit of powder left over. Um, so diarrhea in a, in a diaper tends to look like a, like, like a, it's almost like that halo sign from cerebral spinal fluid, but it's uh, in a diaper because it's absorbed. Um, you make the diagnosis with a history, duh. How many, wet, how, many, uh, how many times is he stooling every day? Eight, nine, 10, 15 times a day. It's watery, got it. You're gonna water their, watch their fluid intake and look for signs of dehydration and fix the dehydration if there's a problem. We used to have this diet called the BRAT diet. We talked about this briefly in the nutrition class. We know that we no longer use the BRAT diet. And why do we no longer recommend the BRAT diet? What is the BRAT diet? Rice, bananas. applesauce, and toast. Right, bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. And why do we not offer the brat diet anymore? Because there's no nutrient. Because there's no protein in it. Protein. Okay, that there's nothing there. Bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. It's not much. So we don't offer uh, diet. We don't offer the brat diet anymore. We just offer them whatever they'll eat, and then you know encourage them to drink fluids and just replace their waters as much as they can. And then of course working on preventative measures. Good high hand hygiene is, is critically important. Okay? We accidentally poison ourselves all the time, especially when we're children, by not washing our hands. And so we get something nasty on our hands, we put it in our mouth, and we end up with a GI upset. Okay? So teaching them to wash their hands and keep their fingers out of their friends' noses and buttholes and that kind of stuff. Okay? Vomiting is diarrhea from the other side, right? You guys, this should not come as any surprise, and I shouldn't have to spend more than 30, than five seconds on it, right? Good. Okay. <laughs> so the same thing for vomiting as we have for diarrhea is, you know, oral, uh, 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 rehydrate them, probably, preferably oral, anti-medic medications, and watch for how we're eating, or what, what, what food we're preparing. Formula preparation is a major source of, uh, of uh, foodborne illnesses, and you exhibit foodborne illnesses with diarrhea and, um, um, and vomiting. Um, did I ever tell you, did I ever post, I did post that infant and young child feeding sem seminar on YouTube, didn't I? I know I've done it. If, uh, if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend you watch it. It talks about um, how to feed children in an emergency, like the tsunami hits and, you know, 50,000 people are dead, and we've got these refugee camps set up. How do you feed infant, uh, infant children? I think, um, uh, Ms. I think Hope did, for some people, did she? clinical. I yeah. Think. Okay. I didn't get to see it, but... I know I showed it to my clinical group. Oh, um, you and, Yeah. And, uh, but it showed some pretty amazing things. <laughs> that a child who gets formula in a refugee camp or in a natural disaster camp, in an emergency camp, has a 50-fold increased risk of being admitted to the, to the hospital for diarrheal illness and a 10 times greater risk of dying of, of diarrhea um, if, they're, if they're not given breast milk in a, in, a, in a refugee camp or in an emergency camp. And it's because of sanitary conditions, okay? That it takes one liter of water to make formula for a day and it takes two liters of water on top of that to wash the bottles and the cups and the nipples and all that stuff. So three liters of water when water is scarce is hard. So people tend to cheat and not wash things as well as they should or not, put, not mix the formula properly and they cause diarrhea and vomiting problems. Okay. So that's just a real dramatic thing. But all those things will happen to a lesser extent um, just as part of everyday living. 
Okay. GERD, good old gastroesophageal reflux, where we're getting a weakening of the stomach uh, of the um, esophageal sphincter, and it comes up into the esophagus, and the baby vomits. Now, um, in the last 10 years, the diagnosis of GERD has gone through the roof. Any kid who vomits more than once or twice a day, they say he's got to be GERD, and they'll put him on Pepsid and all that wonderful stuff. And you got all these six-month-olds on gastroesophageal, uh, uh, on reflux medicine. Um, and you may know, you will notice that it's almost always formula-fed babies. And it's because formula-fed babies tend to be overfed. The, the baby's stomach only holds one or two ounces. You try to give them six or seven ounces, they'll probably throw up until their stomach uh, dilates enough to handle it. Um, and so I always, when I have a kid with GERD, I always want to assess the feeding. How is the kid eating? What is the kid eating? Can you show me how you feed your baby so I can see? And if they're hanging the baby upside down with an eight ounce bottle, with running into his mouth constantly, I have a nice low hanging fruit, something easy, easy for me to address, right? But, you, but the only way to make the diagnosis is to do a barium swallow in an upper GI, actually look at what's going on when he swallows, which is never done. It's always done clinically. He vomits here, take Nexium. Next, right? right. Um, we can uh, thicken the feedings, but like I said, it's controversial. There's some pretty good evidence coming out of the UK that shows if you give rice cereal to a child who's under the age of six, you increase his risk of uh, celiac disease where he's not, his, the, the immature intestines are not capable of handling those, um, those uh, grains at that early in life. And so they end up with, uh, with GI problems from it. How old was the child? You said under was six, under, under six, six months. Oh, six months. Yeah, so we don't, you know, we don't recommend anything solid um, until the baby is more than six months old. It's nothing but breast milk um, or, or formula right. for the first six months. So there's a, a habit, especially down here in the south, to throw a little rice cereal in your baby's bottle, and that is not recommended, okay? 100% not recommended. I don't care whose grandmother said it was a good idea. And every once in a while you have pediatricians down here will say that too. It'll help your baby sleep. That's not the problem, okay? I don't want to sedate my, my baby. If I wanted to give him, I could give him Benadryl and make him sleep, you know? How about ground rice? You know how... Ground rice is just like ground cereal. Nothing but breast milk or formula for the first six months, okay? And what the, actual, what the actual wording is until around six months. So what happens is right around five and a half months to six and a half months or so, a kid will start to express interest in your food and will start to watch you eat and will start to pull things into his mouth. That's a kid who's saying, I'm ready to take the next step. Okay, so it could be five months, five and a half months. It could be not until six and a half or seven months, but it's around there and it's based on what the child's going to do. Another way to know when a child's ready to take solid foods is offer him some food and watch what his tongue does. If you try to feed, back in the day, we used to say that you started solid foods at four months. And so you'd offer a kid four months old some solid food and what, is, what does he do? What does is, what is a kid at four months old do when you try to feed him? They go, Immediately. <laughs> they have a powerful tongue thrust. And you scoop it and put it back in. And you scoop it and put it back in. He's not sticking his tongue out accidentally. <laughs> He's trying to tell you something. I'm not ready for that, please. Knock it off. So when the tongue thrust goes away, then you know that they are neurologically ready to swallow solid foods. Okay? And the big problem is if you've got this constant GERD, he might start to lose weight because he's not able to hold anything down. That's pretty significant. A baby who's vomiting all the time and losing weight says that there's something going on. He's not getting food in to his gut. Okay? Oh, why would we assess respiratory status? In case he's swallowing. In case what? Not swallowing. Aspiration. aspiration. Exactly. True GERD is going to, could cause some aspiration, especially because babies spend so much time lying down, right? And so true GERD is going to cause aspiration and problems where he's going to choke and stuff where you'll, you'll feed him and lay him down and he'll <coughs> and he'll choke and, and struggle with breathing a little bit. That's a kid who's truly, you know, having some problems. Okay? We can use proton pump inhibitors. I can't imagine a surgery on a little kid. They'd have to be pretty darn significant. Um, and then, but the big one is just teaching him how to eat. Um, teaching him to eat um, sitting up instead of lying down to keep him sitting up after you feed him for a little while. Okay? Abdominal trauma, just like heart trauma, okay? 
It is a leading cause of death in children, seatbelt injuries and uh, falling off your bike and all that wonderful stuff. They can get injuries to the organs in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the trunk and they need to be treated, uh, identified and treated based on the organ, based on the pain, based on the history, based on, the, on, the, uh, on how the babies, on the, how the kids do it. Okay? All right. Uh, wow, I can't believe I made it through three chapters. That's impressive. I have 158 slides in this lecture. Only 56 more to go. That's right. Doing well. All right. So now we're getting into psych injuries. Now, psych, uh, psych problems are a growing problem in children. It used to be we didn't have this problem. They're growing. And no one can tell me why they're growing. None of the answers make a lot of, make a lot of sense. Uh, there, are, there are too many competing variables here. You know, it could be bad parenting, sure. But I know some pretty good parents with kids with psych injuries, okay, it was with psychological problems. The biggest one, of course, is autism and ADD. We see that like everywhere, right? Um, and so there's always, and there's, there's, there's the other thing is maybe we're listening to it more. We're recognizing it more. Does anybody work with children regularly, large groups of children? Any of you? Hmm? At church. At church? Like are you a Sunday school leader or anything? Yeah? How many kids do you have that, you, that you're responsible for? About 10 to 12. 10 to 12. Okay. Any of them have uh, autism? Uh, not in that group, but in the next up, mm -hmm. there is three. Three. Okay. And are they different than the other children? Uh, one of them has a severe form, but the other two do not. Exactly. Now, um, Kiana, do you remember when you were growing up? I'm sorry. I got you mixed up again. <laughs> do you remember um, when you were growing up, kids like Rain Man, kids with severe autism? No. Never, right? We never saw them, okay? The first child with autism I ever saw was the movie Rain Man, okay, uh, growing up. So, uh, but now I'm a Cub Scout leader. I have 60 Cub Scouts around me all the time. Three kids in my Cub Scout pack have severe form of autism. Not just the weird kid who doesn't want to look you in the eyes and doesn't get along with other kids. That's on the uh, autism spectrum disorder, but or autism disorder spectrum, but it's not what these kids have. Wearing headphones, because so, they can't ha handle verbal stimuli and, and not able, and like, you know, doing this stuff all the time. And, and that's something different, okay? And that's a lot more common than it used to be. They, well, they, they put these children out in the public more now. They certainly they are. Put them in they, school, they used, they to, they used them. to institutionalize the kids. They used to hide them. But even then, you'd know there was a weird kid in your neighborhood, you know? But they, even that's not there. Um, I think because I'm a midwife, everything revolves around birth. And if you remember that re scientific review we did on oxytocin, how oxytocin given in childbirth can lead to anxiety disorders in children. I think what if one in 10,000 kids who get exposed to autism or get exposed to, um, to oxytocin at birth will end up with this severe form of autism? Okay, one in 10,000 doesn't sound like much until you remember there's four million babies born every year. All of a sudden, you start to go, ooh, I wonder, right? The trick is we have no idea what's causing it. We don't know. Um, it, it could be parenting, it could be antibiotic, uh, it could be the, the hand sanitizer that we use. It could be hormones in our chicken. It could be you know what we use to keep our grass green. We haven't the foggiest idea, but what we know is that there is more and more neurologic injury in our children these days than there was 20, 30 years ago. And we, there are, we haven't been able to figure it out. Okay. Your book talks about a few things that could make them susceptible. Genetics, temperament, environment, and exposure to threats. Okay. Um, all of those things are definitely plausible. If you're su genetically susceptible and I expose you to something in utero, it's going to cause a problem, right? Uh, let's move on, let's move on. Now, barriers to seeking mental health care. Uh, the top one here, I think, is probably the most common. Okay, this is for children as well as for grown-ups. But the problem with children is that children are cruel, right? They love to bully and pick on each other all the time. And so a kid with mental illness is going to have a rough time in, in middle school and high school. Okay, and so we tend to try to hide it and try to pretend it's okay. And then um, uh, try, we tend to think of childhood as a happy time. And so a kid can't have, ha can't have depression or anxiety disorders because he's a child and he should be, sa he should be happy. This is a, the innocence of youth and why, what's wrong with this kid, right? 
Um, so it can't possibly be that. And then the other one is that it might just be a phase. You know, the goth kids with 15,000 piercings and tattoos and they're only 12. You know, ah, he'll grow out of it. Well, maybe he won't. Maybe that's something else going on. And so these are all barriers to seeking care. Where, and the other one is not my kid. Other people have children with mental illness. Not my kid. None of my kids can have something wrong with them because they're my kids. And it'll be okay. And I'll make an excuse for why it happens. Okay? So these are all very common um, barriers to, uh, to seeking psychiatric uh, help. So, the, the big things, let's talk a little bit about anxiety. I think that anxiety is overdiagnosed. Okay? I think there's a certain amount of recognition that goes into it, and then a lot of people who say they're anxious really aren't anxious. That it's, it's something that it's, you, know, you get a little worked up once in a while. And we have this bad habit in American society today of saying that all emotions are bad. If you're sad, take a pill. If you're happy, take a pill. If you're, if you're, not, if you're hungry, take a pill. If you're not hungry, take a pill. We have this bad habit of getting rid of all emotions. Like we want us to walk around as automatrons. If something bad happens, you obviously need medicine to make you feel better. No, if something bad happens, you should feel a little grief. That's okay. All right? And so there is definitely that, that we over-respond to emotional changes, and that any emotional change could be considered a problem that needs to be treated. So I, I agree that there is that. But I'm seeing more real anxiety in people, more now than I saw when I went into nursing 20 years ago. I'm seeing more people who are actually anxious all the time, who struggle. I had a woman um, who had, I can't remember the name of the, 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 um, the, the phobia now, but it was basically the fear of illness. And she was terrified of hospitals and sick people, and if she vomited, it would freak her out. She, was, she had a phobia about illness. It was an interesting patient to have, you know. <laughs> And, you know, she fit well with midwives because we don't think of pregnancy as an illness, right? This is all a happy time, a developmental process, and so it worked really well. But how odd. And there was nothing in her history that I could find that would, that would figure out why she had this illness. She just was. Okay? So anxiety is signs of anxiety that do not abate or they get worse with time, okay? That you try your coping skills and the coping skills don't work and they start to interfere with your activities of daily living, okay? They provide, pervade more than one aspect of the child's life and they cause significant distress, okay? Uh, we need to work up the, complete, uh, the complete, complete history and physical, figure out what's going on in the family, figure out what else is happening and try to find a source for the anxiety. It could be childhood sexual abuse, it could be physical abuse, it could be bullying at school, it could be any number of things. And so we want to try to track down anything that could make the kid anxious before we start treating him for an anxiety disorder. Okay? And this is that question that was on the test, the kid who comes back to the clinic over and over and over again to be worked up for the same somatic complaints. Okay. Um, nausea and vomiting, headaches, abdominal pain, um, those are all classic somatic complaints that, that, um, that turn out to be anxiety-based. Okay? Let's see here. Nursing care is, uh, is to work on coping skills, uh, uh, get the parents and the children and the friends involved, and, uh, and teach relaxation, deep breathing, and problem-solving techniques. Okay? An awful lot of it will be fixed this way without having to go to pharmaceuticals. And this is the pinnacle of nursing. This is, qu uh, um, what's the word I'm looking at? Quintessential. This is quintessential nursing care, education, and coping skills. Okay? Post traumatic stress disorder. Same thing in childhood as it is in adults. Often, what do you think their tra traumatic uh, uh, past could be? Abuse. Abuse is probably the most common. Car accidents you know, traumatic events, that kind of thing. But these days we're diagnosing uh, post-traumatic stress disorder from a number of weird things. Nadal Hassan, they were trying to say, was hearing about uh, post-traumatic stress gave him stress. Uh, and, um, um, that's the, the Fort Hood shooter, that just hearing about people going over to, to fight and gave him pre-traumatic stress disorder. What a weird world we live in. Okay? Um, uh, it's important, just like in adults, to provide a secure place and to, to, to help work, give them the coping skills 
to learn how to make it not happen, how to control it, and then pharmaceutical help if we need it. Okay? Mood disorders. Depression, extremely common. Persistent, sad, or irritable mood. Loss of interest. Change in body weight. Okay? Same thing in children as it is in adults, especially around uh, in the teenage years. Um, what, do you, what do you think we mean by ensure safety? Take the knives out of their room. Okay, <laughs> good. And Have you guys ever heard of a suicide contract? Mm -hmm. Yeah? With teenagers? Or yeah, yeah. With, with anybody, but so with teenagers time. particularly, yeah. <laughs> a suicide contract, I don't mean a suicide pact oh. where five or six people are going to kill themselves. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> as the healthcare provider, um, I routinely will make a contract with patients. That I recognize that, you know, the, 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 the contract will say something to the effect of, you know, I recognize that I have a high postpartum depression score. And I recognize that I've been diagnosed with postpartum depression. And I know that I have thoughts of harming myself from time to time. And I promise that I will call Tom Johnston at this phone number if I have any thoughts of harming myself. And believe it or not, they do. They call you, okay? Because people who are suicidal don't necessarily want to die, okay? It's a, chron it's a chronic health condition, and they don't want to die, and they're afraid of dying. But their brain keeps telling them that they have to die, okay? And, um, and so they will, they will reach out for help, um, oftentimes, if you simply give them a lifeline to offer. And you express to them that you care about them, that you don't want them to die, and that, you know, and that I'm going to be here for you if you, want, if you feel like you need help. Okay, and so you make a suicide contract, and then you know I'll uh, I'll well, when I see him again I'll say uh, so you know have you thought of harming yourself since the last time I saw you? Yeah, well I didn't get a phone call. You're violating my contract. What happened here? We had an agreement. You'd call me. Well I didn't want to bother you. Well I wouldn't give you my phone number if I didn't want to be bothered. Okay, it's not a bother. So you have to make the contract and then follow up with it and reinforce because they feel they, most people think that you're kidding, that you don't really mean it. You know, like they would rather that you were dead. You know, or they, and, and it's not the way it is. So uh, you want to make the contract and follow up with it. Okay. Bipolar disorder. This used to be called something else. What was it called 15 years ago? Manic depression. Manic depression. I thought manic depression sounded better than bipolar. Yeah. At least it told you what it was. Okay. <laughs> but bipolar disorder is that you spend time manic and you spend time depressed. Okay. Do I need to go through these? These guys have all had psych, right? Yep. This is a junior yeah. thing. Okay. The real thing that's important to understand is that it can happen in children. Okay. And the trick to it is that children don't have the adult coping skills that they need. Okay. Remember that children, until they're about 25 years old, are not capable of overcoming um, um, uh, uh, what's the word? impulses. They have a lot of problem with impulse control. They have a lot of problem with younger children, especially before the age of 15 or so, have problems with abstract thought and understanding you know, that there is something better out there. They can only live very much in the moment. And so they have these mental disease, these mental disorders, and they don't have the faculties that adults have to fight back. And so they're more uh, likely to have uh, comorbidities than adults are, or to have maladaptive behavior in response to it. Um, it's and, and you know teenage suicide is very very common. Not as common as 22 year old suicide, but it's very common. Much more uh, if you can make it past like 25, 30, you, your chance of suicide drops pretty dramatically um, um, until you become an old person and old people kill themselves all the time. Uh, <laughs> they do. They're like ah, oh, what's the, anyway. <laughs> so you want to remove you know make them safe. We talk about removing harmful items from the home, keeping medicines locked up, and teaching people how to respond. If somebody tries to kill themselves, were they just faking? No. Never, right? It's not a cry, it's not a, oh, they just want attention, and that's why they cut themselves. That's not the way that works, okay? If something's going on, okay? And then there are three questions that, uh, that are very important um, to ask somebody. Have you ever thought about, about hurting yourself? Okay, I, I, I always ask, have you ever thought of hurting yourself? If you were going to hurt yourself, how would you do it? And do you have a means to carry that out? Okay, I've always, you know, I think about hurting myself, really. How do you plan to do it? Well, I would take pills. Well, do you have pills in the home? I sure do. 
That's a person who's particularly at risk for suicide. Okay? How do you plan, you know, I think about hurting myself. Yeah? How would you die? Uh, I would jump off a skyscraper. Okay, but you live in Nebraska. I'm not too worried about you. Right? There aren't a lot of skyscrapers in Nebraska. Right? So they don't have a means to do it. I want to shoot myself in the head, but I don't own a gun. Okay. You're probably not as at high risk as somebody who's a gun owner who wants to shoot themselves in the head, right? So it's, have you ever thought of doing it, and um, how would you do it, and do you have a means to carry it out, okay? And then um, support, refer, lots of drugs that you can use. Schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is not well recognized in children. Um, most, uh, most, um, most schizophrenics happen in the 20s or early 30s. Uh, there is a report of a nine-year-old with schizophrenia, but it's incredibly rare to have pediatric schizophrenia. Um, but schizophrenia is the same in children as it is in adults. There's a whole MTV thing, it was like, true life, I have schizophrenia, yeah. this girl was like six. Yeah. And it was the craziest thing. Yeah. And the biggest problem with that is getting people to believe that she has schizophrenia. Yeah. Because childhood is a happy, sacred time where nothing bad can happen, right? And of course it can happen. All right. Cognitive disorders. Oh, my God, when will this lecture ever end? 30 minutes. Yeah, we can stop. But only for five minutes, because we, we only got 30 minutes left. The best part's coming. The best part's coming? Any minute now. The Wait, best part is past. Holy cow, there's a lot more to go. It's only 35. I'm going to fall. I, know, I cut out hundreds of slides. The respiratory chapter itself had 108 slides, and I cut it down to like 30. <laughs> That's unfortunate. All right, five minutes. I'm getting a cup of joe. I sure do. But it's, it's half cap, so it's not full caffeinated coffee. That's why I can drink quite a No, that's why I just like the taste of hot brown water. I think I found She puts that on Bible though at three o'clock. Didn't she sure know that she had enough time between now and then? I mean that doesn't make some time all the time. So yeah, but that's why every night. Who knows? Mm -hmm. That's cool. 
clever. Did you guys make the uh, the top display on that Christmas tree? We did. Yeah. The first class. It's medicine cups and gold glitter. How clever. <laughs> All right. Okay, you said it's there. What's that? Yeah, you have to go out of it and go back into it. What's this? Never mind. All right. We are back up again. So let's kind of, I'm going to skip a little bit here. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. The big thing about Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder um, is, of course, recognizing and trying to tell the difference between normal boys and Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Uh, my seven-year-old, oh, he's eight years old now, he can't sit still. The kid runs all over the house, and most of the time he runs all over the house being a T-Rex. So he runs like this, <laughs> all over the house. And it cracks me up. But that's what eight-year-olds do, right? That's fine. If he were 15 doing that, I might have a problem, right? No, that's all you get. It's on, it's on Google, it's on YouTube forever. Okay. But it's important to understand that we give medications for ADD, and children have to take a break from these medications every once in a while. And why is that? Because their body gets used to it. No. Because it causes um, problems with your appetite. And growth. And growth. Yep. And so you. their growth gets stunted, and they lose height. They lose inches by taking, uh, by taking uh, Ritalin. And so, interestingly enough, they tend to take the summers off, which means only school teachers get a break. <laughs> when you take your three months off in the summer and you regain some of your, your, your lost height and weight, uh, then you come back to school again. I'm sure that it makes children, it makes parents, uh, teachers, uh, um, very happy when their students can sit still. But uh, <laughs> I would just take my kids out of school. Fine, just don't worry about it. I'll tell my teacher myself. I was like the very end of the day because uh -huh. we were going somewhere. And this child was not, and he was just like, I was like, Mom, can you like bungee, like bungee cord this kid to his seat? Like, he is driving me nuts, and I've only been here five minutes. She's like, but see, I'm a pretty normal kid, and when I remember as a kid sitting in, uh, in church, it was physically painful to sit still. And I don't know if you guys experienced it, but as, as I experienced it, I would be sitting there like this, and my butt would ache and burn, and I would have to move. And if I didn't move, so it hurt. Mm -hmm. What's that? It's so much worse yeah. than that when you but, actually have it. Yeah, but the trick is that it's, you know, we... We tend to say, just to stop squirming. You can't. It's just not fair. Okay? It just can't be done. We're not meant to sit in a room and stare at a screen all day. We're just not meant to do it. Things like this are totally unnatural. And you can't achieve this in an eight-year-old, no matter how hard you try. And so, um, but the important thing to remember is that they need a break from their Ritalin every once in a while so they can catch up on all the growth that they lost. Okay. Quick share about bungee cording a kid. When I was seven years old, my teacher in um, the Philippines, uh -huh. I have this classmate, he's just hyper. Uh, not diagnosed, probably, probably, I don't uh -huh. know. But anyway, one day she said, if you won't stop running around or doing lectures, I will tie you up in a chair and put you on the table. And one day he didn't, because that's just him. <laughs> she put him in a chair like this and tie around and cord, and he was just sitting like that. <laughs> Yeah, there's a comedian, what's his name, uh, Bill Ingvall. He tells a joke about, about ADD, like, yes. did you ever have attention deficit disorder? I did, for about five seconds, and my dad whopped me upside the head, Aww. and I learned how to pay attention really fast. <laughs> That's what my dad used Yep. Okay, so oppositional defiant disorder is exactly what it sounds like. And the difference, and the thing about this and, uh, and ADD and all that stuff is, and anxiety and depression is the normal behavior gets out of hand and starts to interact with, with, uh, with activities of daily living. So frequent temper tantrums, obsessive arguing. This is teenager on steroids, right? Everybody when they were 16 <laughs> had all of these things, okay? But the trick is that it's, um, it becomes excessive, yeah. okay? And it's all about teaching about uh, coping skills. Tourette's syndrome. 
everybody's favorite, um, everybody's favorite mental tick, and the ability to swear all the time. As a great comedian who says, and why is Tourette's syndrome oh, yeah. never pleasant? I love your hat. Uh, <laughs> you know, why is it always swearing? It's never pleasant. We went to high school with a girl with uh -huh. Tourette's, and she was in my Spanish one class, and um, our, we had a sub give us our final, and she like squeaked was her thing, like I don't, like just she'd be like mid sentence and would like squeak, and at first we we're like, what the heck? But then like it just became like we just didn't even notice anymore. Mm -hmm. But the sub didn't know that she had Tourette's. And so she was like, she was like, you know, when we were just all, you know, chilling before the exam, and I guess I got on the steps and nerves. She was like, excuse me, but can you stop? And the girl goes, I have Tourette's, and like yells at her, like across the room, and all of us are like looking back and forth between the sub and the girl. It was the funniest thing. Like, I know that shouldn't be funny, but that was really funny. No, it makes sense. Well, they, it was hilarious. That's unfortunate because nobody told the sub they had a kid with Tourette's. Yeah, I know. I just feel so like it's something you should. Be they kind of set them up for failure, right? But Tourette's is, is more than just um, blurting out. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of, of, of neuromuscular tics. Um, blinking, neck jerking, twisting, tensing, touching, um, multiple times a day. Okay? And we need to recognize it and recognize that, it, that you know, not only is it annoying for everyone around the person, but it's pretty annoying for the kid who has it too. Okay? And we need to, to educate and prepare. All right, maltreatment of children. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Anybody who mistreats a child deserves to go to hell forever, okay? To be punished forever and burn and all that wonderful stuff. You can really break a child uh, very, very easily, okay? It's, it's, um, and what you, when you harm a child, it affects them for the rest of their life forever. And it turns them into, uh, uh, it gives them problems as in young adulthood, it gives them problems with relationship, it gives them problems with having, with being a parent. It's really evil stuff. But, you know, uh, uh, any kind of abuse or neglect or uh, maltreatment, sexually, physically, or mentally, is abuse. And here are some definitions. Okay? Munchausen by proxy. You know what Munchausen by proxy is? Isn't that when? Someone thinks that, um, like their child is sick, so they get the attention. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. A person, usually the mother, deliberately makes the child sick in order for it to, to, to as a, as a way of reaching out for attention. Okay. And I'm not okay. Electronic, the electronic sexual luring. That's just the pedophile who goes online instead of driving around the creepy white van. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you can really severely break people. I've got lots of stories about women who are pregnant, um, who um, who you know were physically or sexually abused as children, and the things that they that they turn into as adults. It's just awful. It's awful to do that to people. Um, understanding that oftentimes these are you know these people were abused themselves, and this is the way they express you know emotions, or this is what they consider normal. Eh. It's still it's, it, it, they still deserve to rot in hell. So, I can understand it, that doesn't mean that I like them, right? right. And so we need, to, uh, we need to pay attention. Children who are coming back for, you know, somatic complaints for no good reason, over and over and over again. People, kids who are accident prone, kids who have several bruises of the same age is a big one. So there are these mar marks that you get on toddlers and preschoolers all the time. They're preschool marks. Okay, lots of bruises all over the arms and legs, and they're all different ages and that kind of stuff, because the kids are always falling down and bumping their knees and hurting themselves. Okay, and that's different from a kid who's being abused. Uh, the bruises tend to all happen at about the same time. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it, 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 it's, it's fairly easy to see. The kids are not happy, energetic, outgoing, you know, that kind of thing. They tend to be withdrawn and shy and quiet, and, uh, and, and they have these repeated injuries, broken bones without a good story. Same thing with, with women who get abused, you know, with spouse abuse. Okay? A lot of times the kids will trip up too. Like they can't remember which story they're supposed yeah, to Yeah, they can't remember. You can get them caught in a lie really easy, right? They can't remember which lie they're supposed to tell. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's usually, uh, well, I like to think it's easy to see, but I'm sure there's an awful lot that I don't recognize. You know, substance abuse in children. Same thing as substance abuse in grown-ups. Um, eating disorders. 
anorexia nervosa, bulimia, and binge eating. So what is anorexia nervosa? We had this discussion in nutrition. Uh -huh. The difference between anorexia and anorexia nervosa. Uh -huh. Is the anorexia like without appetite? Yes. And then anorexia nervosa is like where you choose not to eat. Exactly. It's where it becomes a mental illness. Yes. Right? So anorexia is just I'm not hungry. Either because I have an appendicitis, or I have a flu, or I just ate. I have anorexia. Uh -huh. But anorexia, yeah. Anorexia nervosa is when it's taken to the maladaptive stage, where there's something wrong with somebody. They're starving themselves to death for whatever reason. Okay? And in bulimia? Like making yourself throw up. Making yourself vomit. And, and then binge eating usually goes along with bulimia. They eat a lot and then they throw up. And that's because of the, uh, the powerful effect that eating has in our culture. Everything in America is eating, right? All of our holidays revolve around eating big feasts. Feast. Hey, let's go ahead and get a bite to eat. Then after that, we'll go eat. And then and later on, maybe we'll get something to eat. You know, <laughs> It's always eating in America. And so we use food for comfort. We use food socially. We, from the moment we're born, a good baby is a baby who eats... Uh, grows and sleeps and so big fat babies are so cute and everyone's a big fat well-fed baby and so we focus so much on eating um, and uh, uh, um, um, uh, teenagers especially women are more likely to get it than men but uh, they, they as a way of expressing control over their environment will stop eating or will, uh, will eat and then vomit after they eat uh, it's, it's very very common um, with anorexia, it's diagnostic if they're less than 85% of their expected weight and they have a distorted body image and uh, they, uh, uh, they, they stop menstruating. Why would a skinny woman stop menstruating? Because she doesn't have the nutrients to support that physiological process. Mm -mm. She doesn't have the fat which produces the estrogen. There you go. Because fat stores estrogen. It doesn't produce it, it stores it. And so without, without any fat, you don't have a menstrual cycle because you're hypoestrogenic. That's why gymnasts uh, and uh, teenage athletes don't have menstrual cycles either. Okay? Um, and bulimia is lack of control over eating, inappropriate compul uh, compensatory behavior, and binge eating followed by purging. Right? And these can be life-threatening disorders um, and uh, um, they need to be recognized and referred. Uh, setting realistic weight goals, and uh, I've met some anorexics, they're downright tricky. They'll sew rolls, I've had them sew rolls of quarters into their jacket, <laughs> and so it makes them a couple pounds, makes them a pound heavier than they really are. Uh, they're tricky. Okay. Obesity, why this is here, uh, everybody's fat? <laughs> Get tested for diabetes. Yeah, right. The, the big thing is that if you got an obese kid, test them for diabetes, right? Um, sleep disorders are really becoming popular these days. Um, we're recognizing um, sleep apnea younger and younger in children and, um, and recognizing that maybe it can be fixed. Uh, uh, any kid who snores excessively, who uh, stops breathing, who has witnessed periods of apnea while they're sleeping, and a kid who's, who's excessively tired during the day should be evaluated for sleep apnea. Okay? Uh, sometimes we can fix it with a simple tonsillectomy. Um, sometimes they have to go on CPAP. Um, but we've now come to recognize that you shouldn't be tired during the day if you sleep what you would think is a normal seven or eight hours a day. And if you are tired during the day, you might have a sleep disorder that needs to be addressed. Oh, we're getting there. <laughs> 10 more minutes and like 30 more slides. Fragile X syndrome. <laughs> Who gets fragile X syndrome? Boys or girls? Girls. Girls, exactly. Um, they tend to be uh, 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 infertile, have learning disabilities, and they tend to be kind of almost, uh, they're, they're kind of squat and small. Okay? Squat. Squat. <laughs> They always remind me of Down syndrome, but not quite. Okay, uh, nursing care is you know really developmental uh, assistance and getting them involved in uh, in the proper uh, early intervention services. Down syndrome, big things about Down syndrome. We all do you all know what Down syndrome is? Yes. Okay, trisomy 21, right? Yeah, trisomy 21, um, and so it's a genetic dis uh, chromosomal anomaly along the 21st chromosome. But it has some pretty specific um, 
um, uh, syndromal features. The, you guys know a definition of a syndrome is repetitive features, right? That everybody who has a syndrome has these features, okay? Poor motor, motor tone is a big one. They have trouble eating, they tend to stick their, they feel like their tongue is stuck out all the time, and then like that. Um, and they have, but they just have poor tone, not just in their face, but their whole body. So they have a generalized weakness as children. They need physical therapy to overcome it. Slanting eyes are there, uh, uh, and uh, with epicanthal folds that are a little bit lower set on the face than, than are normal, or than we would normally expect to see. Short, broad hands, single crease across the palm, and what's that P crease called? Sometimes I forget you guys I can are. See it in the book. Yeah, sometimes I forget you guys are undergraduates, and it's my job to tell you this. Because <laughs> I'm like, everybody knows this. Why don't you know this? You're nurses. What? Someone said it. What? Simeon crease, exactly. Yes. Uh, one single crease across the palm that you'll see. Mm -hmm. Hyperflexibility, which comes along with the poor uh, motor tone. A flat bridge of the nose, short, low set ears, um, and they tend to have a broad webbed neck as well. Okay. Uh, funny story before I was a nurse, um, there was uh, this TV show, what was it called? Like Happy Days? Not Happy Days. It was. It was, a, it was a show about this kid who had Down syndrome. Um, and this was when Special Olympics was first starting, and I was first experiencing Down syndrome, and I thought it was the same kid on all these shows. <laughs> I thought they were using the same actor, because they all look exactly alike. Um, and, uh, and my wife had to go, no moron. <laughs> That's what Down syndrome looks like. <laughs> What's that? He's like, he's rich, he has all these Yeah, right, I'm thinking like the same kid is everywhere I look. Wow, every time I see Down syndrome, I see the same kid. <laughs> And they were like, no, stupid. <laughs> That's what Down syndrome looks like. But I wasn't a nurse yet. No one told me this stuff, right? <laughs> and we usually, uh, we often defi can, describe, can find Down syndrome in utero with our simple prenatal testing. Um, and most parents who have a baby with Down syndrome know it before the baby is born. But if not, we'll spot it pretty much as soon as they're born. They have a very classic look to them. Okay? The nursing care is sensitive to the parents. Remember... The poor motor tone is going to cause difficulty with children with, with their developmental uh, gains and with how they eat. And they also, it's not mentioned here, but they also very commonly have a heart defect. A ventral septal defect is the most common. Uh, but it's, uh, um, people with Down syndrome tend to have congenital heart anomalies an awful lot. And so a baby with, with, in the nursery with Down syndrome needs to be watched very carefully, carefully for signs that he's going to decompensate. Okay? And they tend to not live a full life. They tend to die in their 40s or 50s, again, from the heart defects. Okay. Intellectual disabilities, um, you know, it's always interesting. Um, you know the average IQ? Anyone know the average IQ off the top of your head? It's not terribly high. The average IQ is like 85, 90, something like that. Okay. And the definition of average means that half of the people are higher than that and half of the people are lower than that, right? So you won't see this in nursing school, so don't look at each other. But <laughs> go to the mall and look around and half of the people there have a below average IQ. <laughs> and I always think that's interesting. I'm like, well, that explains it. <laughs> <laughs> and so like you go to these high schools, you're like, really, moron? Oh, I get it, you're that half. <laughs> You're that half. <laughs> You're that half, right? But no, it's, there's a, there, are, there are degrees of, uh, of low IQs um, and terms that like, like idiot. Uh, idiot is actually a, a medical term for an IQ, I believe it's less than 75, uh, is an idiot. Um, and, uh, and then there's another one for, uh, for an IQ less than 50 and another one for an IQ less than 25. Uh, there, are, there are actually words in, the, in our, in our diet that we use, that we throw around, that really are, you know, actual medical diagnoses, okay? But it's, uh, uh, it's important to recognize these uh, uh, children with low IQs so that you can teach them appropriately and help them accommodate in life as well as you can, okay? For the severely mentally disabled, there are, you know, programs and houses that, that take care of them, okay? Autism spectrum disorder. We could spend a week talking about it, okay? It's everywhere. And the current theory about autism is early intervention can help them to lead a normal life. And so uh, you want to recognize children who have, uh, who have autism early on. 
Okay? And these are some of the signs and symptoms. Persistive qualitative impairment in social reciprocity. What the heck does that mean? Stuff. Any idea? They Stuff, huh? They don't get along with the kids. They have um, social issues. They have, they right. They have trouble interacting and, and being social with other people. They tend to do things like they won't look you in the eye. They won't, they won't make eye contact with you. They tend to turn away. And they just act off all the time. It's like, well, you know, you're around a kid and you're like, why do you act that way? It could be autism. The other one that's real common is restrictive repetitive behaviors or interests. A kid who becomes obsessed with Thomas the Tank Engine or dinosaurs or <coughs> Legos or whatever. And again, this is not just your standard and like my eight-year-old who runs around pretending to be a T-Rex all the time. This is obsessive behavior, not just unusual behavior. What's that? Yeah. Oh, he's fun. He's fun. He's like, he's like Speedy Gonzalez running all over here. You guys know who Speedy Gonzalez. Whose brother has Asperger's, and when Michael Jackson died, he was obsessed. With Michael Jackson, yeah. like yeah. absolutely obsessed. And then when Obama ran for office the first time, he was obsessed with Obama. And then his recent thing is is Carolina, like UNC Chapel Hill. He saw the life flight helicopter, and ever since then, he is like he you know, can tell you every stat about every football, basketball, baseball player. Like he is a walking encyclopedia. Anything concerning Chapel Hill, like it is the craziest mm -hmm. thing. That's how my and nephew is with dinosaurs. Yeah. He's five, and he knows every single dinosaur sure. name, knows how to pronounce every single name, knows uh, literally everything about them. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Now, if you go back to your pediatric development, this is that sense of mastery that young school-aged children are, are getting into, right? They become a master of several of things, like they become masters of dinosaurs, or masters of, of you know, UNC, or that kind of thing. And the difference is where, when it starts to become maladaptive. Um, now, there's a, a very common theory out there about autism, especially Asperger's, that it's just hyper male syndrome, okay? If you notice, it's almost exclusively autism is found in men, uh, in males, not in, in women. It's something like eight to one. Um, very, very common among, among males. And um, a lot of the traits in autism are what you, what you would see in men, just exaggerated a little bit. Difficulty with emotional attachments, um, you know, not being terribly cuddly and emotionally and huggy, um, um, uh, difficulty forming bonds, especially with strangers, uh, um, very analytical thought processes. Uh, those things are, are masculine traits, but just exaggerated masculine traits. And so there is, there is some stuff out there that maybe autism is just a hyper-masculine syndrome. It's weird because um, with my nephew, he yeah. was diagnosed with Asperger's, but yeah. he, like I said, he is obsessed with dinosaurs, but he's like overly affectionate. Hmm. Like, he takes care of everybody. That's but cute. But then he also has those ticks and stuff. Like, he'll go up to corners and stuff and just sit there and, like, shake them. Yeah. And I always wonder, like, where is all that coming from? I think we could talk about that for a while. But now we talk about it as a spectrum. Fetal alcohol syndrome, or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Didn't we talk about this once before? That it's some degree of alcohol, especially in the second trimester of pregnancy, uh, causes a neurologic injury uh, to children. Um, they tend to have abnormal facial features, growth problems, oh, yeah. um, they have mental retardation. And I told the story about Italy, Italians. right? About how yes. all Italians look that way. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. And the trick is, we don't know uh, how much alcohol causes fetal alcohol syndrome, right. so we just say none. But we have to recognize we have a child who doesn't quite look like everybody else, who's a little bit mentally uh, retarded, um, it could be some fetal alcohol syndrome. And all we do is, is you know, get into early intervention, just like we do with autism, just like we do with mental retardation, just like we do with Down syndrome, and try to make the best of the environment that we have based on what we have. Okay? I am not going to do this. Oh, you guys know what encopresis is? It's, 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 it's inappropriate uh, bowel habits. So it's, um, it's, you know, nighttime. It's just, it's a failure of potty training, basically. It's often linked to abuse or some kind of childhood trauma. Um, you have a child who had been previously potty trained who moves from, you know, Texas to Maryland or whatever, and then they stop, they stop, they have to go back 
and they're no longer potty trained. You have to re-potty train. It, it tends to be an, an anxiety uh, uh, condition. But it, can, but it can come along with constipation, straining pain, anal fissures, and fecal retention. Um, and, uh, uh, um, and they tend to poop and hide it. Like instead of pooping in the toilet, they just really freak out about pooping. Uh huh. He will go not the toilet, but he won't go poop. Mm -hmm. He refuses to poop on the toilet. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I know that's not that, right? But he just well, it's a form thereof. You know, he's it's like, it's Freud's I'm anal just... stage, right? Yeah. Uh, where he's kind of stuck in what mm -hmm. Freud would call anal retentive. You know, and mm -hmm. this is part of that. Like he'll be like, I have to pee, and he'll run to the bathroom. And how old is he? And that's pretty normal for a three-year-old. It's not normal for a five or six-year-old. You'll know he's pooping, though, because he'll get really quiet, and he'll hide behind a piece of furniture, and he'll poop. And then you have to chase him around for five minutes to catch him, and then change him. He just won't go on the toilet. And that'll he'll grow out of that. He's only three and a half. dirty or something. I know a lot of kids say What's that? They say it's dirty? Yeah. And toilets make a lot of noise, they can be scary. Rugrats has a great episode about the toilet. It's hilarious. About toilet training and how scary the toilet is. <laughs> it's funny. Okay. Did I take out enuresis? I did. There's another one for, for, for peeing, it's called enuresis. Um, inappropriate, um, inappropriate urination. All right. Thank God for dying. And that is the last lecture you get. That's it. Next week is exam four, and then I think we take finals. Are we going to have a session on Monday? Yeah, sure. Yes. I love the great calendar. Yeah, I'll work through my Thanksgiving weekend to make you guys happy. That's okay. No, that's fine. It's not like you have kids or anything. Yeah, not like I have anything better to do. a couple of those.